Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to my favorite book. This is episode number 14. Can you believe it? There's only four more left. My name is Monica. I work at Brooklyn, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, we're about to hear from Gunzier, who is going to present the favorite book that they've ever made. Um, but before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the land from where from which we're broadcasting is part of the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people. Please join us in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Brooklyn Inc. is a nonprofit organization located in Brooklyn, New York. We're celebrating 22 years of promoting artist books and art as primary research materials and uh, art and tools for, tools for social justice. Uh, we distribute work by artists and organizations within the academic market. We also host workshops and exhibitions, and we publish books and archival box sets. And we are super excited to be doing our first serialized online program, My Favorite Book. This is a program where we ask 18 different artists to quickly tell us all about their favorite book that they've ever made. Every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday throughout the entire month of June, we will have a new episode for you every night, uh, 7 to 7.30. You can check our website for a full listing, um, or you can just drop in on YouTube any night. I'm gonna flash our details here. You can find lots of things on these links. Uh, you can find us at Bookland Art uh, at, on Instagram or our website, bookland.org. At Linktree slash Bookland, there are lots of fun little links. You can download our free education manual, newly designed uh, by Partner and Partners. Um, yeah, that's it. I also want to thank the New York City Department for, Cult uh, for Cultural Affairs for sponsoring my favorite book. Thank you for that. Okay, so tonight we are very delighted to introduce Gunzier, who's going to present the book Solar Grid. Actually, it's a series of books. Um, after I read Gunzier's bio, I'm going to hand it over to him. Um, he'll talk for about 15 minutes, and then we'll do a brief Q&A. Um, you can type questions into the chat if you're listening and watching on YouTube Live, and I will moderate. Gunzier operates seamlessly between art, design, and storytelling. His work has been seen in a wide variety of art galleries, impromptu spaces, alleyways, and major museums around the world. He is also the recipient of Foreign Policy's Global Thinker Award. Egyptian born, he's now based in Houston, Texas. Hi, Gunzier. Hey, Monica. Um, it's great, great to, to be here on the My Favorite Book series. Thanks for doing this. Um, do I just dive right in? Yes. OK, I'll dive right in. So uh, today, I will talk about The Solar Grid, uh, which is a serialized graphic novel, um, which um, has uh, is finally seeing print um, as of a couple of months ago, um, although I have been working on it since uh, 2016. So, so far we have issues one, two, and three have come out from Radix Media. And um, although I do see the kind of the, the, the series as one, um, one work, um, I do know that today we're talking about one particular book. So I will talk today about chapter three, um, mainly, uh, and I will say like why it is my uh, favorite uh, book out of the ones that have come out so far. Please excuse the uh, dramatic uh, shaky cam. Um, so this is number three right here. And um, uh, the reason I will say uh, this is my favorite book out of uh, the out of the series in general, but maybe first I should talk a little bit about the series. So um, the series is um, it's a work of science fiction. Um, the 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 gist of kind of the statement of I pretty much made right away um, on uh, page one of chapter one. So talks about climate change, uh, hyper consumerism, um, capitalism. Um, but uh, really kind of on a, on a, on a planet-faring scale. Um, but let's dive into chapter three, and, uh, and I'll explain why 
this one in particular is my favorite without getting uh, too much into the story, I guess. Um, so one, uh, each chapter, the title of each chapter is taken from a quote. And the quote for this chapter is by Van Gogh. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, this particular quote is, is, a, is a very kind of dear one to, uh, to my heart and my practice in general. Painting is a faith that imposes the duty to disregard public opinion. Um, but one of the reasons um, uh, this uh, chapter is my favorite out of the three that have come out so far, it is, it is the first time we get a, a pretty good look at the inhabited part of um, what is called waste country, which is a, a place on earth that is basically a, a, a never ending landfill where Mars sends its waste back to earth. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, people live in this area and this is kind of the first glimpse of it where uh, the actual houses and, and are kind of made up of, of whatever's, um, whatever people could find, right? So you have bits and pieces of, of cars and, uh, old kind of doors and, uh, and signage. Here's a bit of a bus right here with some corrugated metal sheeting, uh, solar panels, um, um, so on and so forth, and and like uh, for me, like I I could probably like do an entire graphic novel set only in this this particular setting, um, but the the solar grid as it is kind of takes place all over. Um, the other reason I will say this particular chapter is my favorite is um, it's the first time I experiment with this particular style right here. So what I do in the solar grid is. Um, I jump around in timeline in, in between different timelines and to kind of distinguish to the reader that the timeline is in fact uh, a very different world, I adopt a different style. So you'll see this one is like kind of really quick brush strokes, um, a lot of ink wash is involved. This is because at this point in time, the world is flooded. So I wanted that. Um, that kind of wet, almost moldy feeling to kind of permeate throughout all the pages, which is very different to this kind of very stark, clean style you see here, um, or even very, very fine line style here, uh, at which point the world is kind of, um, has already dried up and the water is all, has evaporated. Um, and, uh, and the world is alight as a result of essentially the solar grid, which the title is named after, which is a network of satellites that keep the earth uh, vast in eternal daylight, basically to power these factories uh, that run on earth. We get a glimpse of the factory setting right there uh, that run on earth, basically to produce goods for export to Mars. Um, and uh, so this, uh, the, the, so it's, it's the first time I experimented with this style, which I really enjoyed. Um, I like to do a lot more with, um, and also it, it has a segment that takes place in Cairo, um, which is where I'm from. And so, you know, it gets a little personal here. Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't call it like an autobiographical work, but um, this, this bit has some semi-autobiographical bits. Um, I mean, there is a street artist. I, I dabbled in a bit of street art here and there, um, <clears throat> and her experience kind of running into uh, uh, civilians uh, who object to it, as well as with the cops later on. Um, and um, that is kind of uh, it for chapter, chapter three. Um, I could get into other uh, chapters, but it depends how we're doing on time, um, which I'm not keeping very well. Maybe Monica or, or Marshall could chime in. I think I can only chime in when I'm actually here. Yeah, go ahead. You got lots of time. Oh, I do? Yeah, go for oh, it. Cool. Um, so in that case, uh, let, let, let's talk about like the series in general. So the series, series is, um, is uh, as you can see, it's one out, like, out of 10. So it, it'll be 10 parts in total. Uh, each each uh, 
issue or chapter is about 40 pages, give or take. Um, and basically, um, it follows these two orphans on Earth. Mahrit and Kameen right here. Um, and they essentially, um, uh, basically, uh, more than 900 years after the Earth has suffered a global flood, um, they are now, Earth is actually dry and desolate, and they are they just rummage through the waste on Earth, searching for items um, that they could um, live off. And they come upon an item, this poster right here, um, which basically uh, starts a domino effect um, that leads to, um, uh, leads to essentially the destruction of the solar grid um, and um, a complete uh, disruption of the relationship between Mars and Earth, you know? Um, so, so it is a, a story of upheaval, of uh, revolt, of taking down kind of oppressive systems that have been, that have been built over generations. Um, but it is also a story of how the efforts to resist the solar grid, which is what we see here in chapter three, uh, for one, as one example with the street artist, uh, how efforts to resist the solar grid have, even though they might have failed in the past, um, they um, they actually contribute to the inevitable um, uh, success of bringing down the solar grid in the in later later in the future. Well, um, that's kind of the, the gist of the story. Um, Does that mean we should come back? That's all I got, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm going to bring someone else into the conversation. Uh, Marshall Weber, uh, Brooklyn's directing curator, um, because I think he may have some interesting comments and things to say to Gonzier. Uh, I'm going to say for anybody listening on YouTube Live that you could put your comments into the chat, and we will integrate those into our conversation. But first, can I just say, I miss comics. I haven't looked at comics in so long. And I'm starting to get my memory back of years and years ago, I think, when you and I had first connected about comics. And I think it was you who introduced me to, um, what was it called? It was uh, Brian Wood's book, uh, Channel Zero, or that collection of comics, and Transmetropolitan. And I'm sure that kind of scratches the surface if there is a genre comics of like kind of post-apocalyptic. So not to say that I'm seeing it in there, but I'm kind of piecing together like, oh, this is starting to like have a larger landscape. And even when you mention, you know, that there are two orphans or just two two people that are kind of the central characters, it makes me think of um, a, a comic series. I think it was a manga series called Girls Last Tour. So, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm kind of, um, it, it's it's pulling me in and I hope that the other people are kind of seeing uh, how big that narrative is and how much um, how much company you have in that kind of landscape of, of comic exploration of these these ideas. For sure, for sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad to contribute to, to pulling you back in to comics. <laughs> <laughs> You are. Um, um, I will. I will say that the solar grid is definitely like, um, from what I'm seeing from the readership, is um, a little bit like me in the sense that I see a lot of people who may have, maybe they grew up reading comics and then at a certain point they grew out of comics, you know, and they got interested in uh, other forms of literature. Um, because in general, like the comic book landscape, uh, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of the same stuff, and then to find the not same stuff, you have to kind of really sift through a lot, uh, which which so so many people aren't aware of uh, those those little gems that you could sort of find, and um, and and yeah, I'm seeing a lot of the readers who are kind of of that type who just lost interest uh, in comics at a point, and then and then uh, with the solar grid, I think it. Uh, it has the, the 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 comics medium is there, which they they like, but the subject matter is not necessarily what you typically find in most comics, and maybe has more in common with what they might find in other um, 
other readings possibly. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Marshall? Um, well, first, I'm just like so stricken by Gonzir's modesty because <laughs> it's really funny, um, you know, in terms of the presentation um, and because Solar Grid is like any great um, piece of literature and especially when we think of comics as somewhat inherently having a popular universal appeal, it like builds this whole universe. You know, like what is the term now people are using is a world building. Um, you know, so this story takes place amidst like, like you were pointing at that one page spread and there's like a thousand stories in the page spread that are suggested, you know, by the, the graphic elements. And it's, it's almost as if the text is just one of the highlighted stories going on in the solar grid. Like the, it, it's w without of it, you, you know, it's like kind of one of those, you know, my looking at it and my reading through it is uh, you could spend a lot of time in this universe. Like there's something about it that is there's a, both this like specific narrative story, but there's also this like ability just to wander around in all the detail. And, and it really reminds me of some of like the Windsor McKay thing where like, sometimes you just look through the whole book before you even read it. Like you just look at yeah. it and then you go back and read it and, and, and then you start to integrate the text with the details as opposed to the figurative elements and that's another universe. And so I wonder if that, you know, am I being like, is this hyperbole coming from me? Do I just really like this story and your work or do you kind of feel this way about it? No, it's true. I, you know, like I said, I've been working on it since 2016, so I've been kind of in, in and out of the world, I guess, but really in the world uh, for a very long time now. And the more I spend time in it, the more, um, the 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 more the more real real it becomes, and the more um, the more it, it shows me more of itself in a way. You know what I mean? Um, and I discover a lot of stuff and then I keep on coming up, like uh, just noticing things and, and, and I could see the possibility of doing all manner of stories that have spawned from the world. So, you know, as an example, uh, I'll do shaky cam again. Um, as an example, here in chapter two, um, you know, we have these, uh, we follow these two essentially cops for a minute, um, who, who work for Safety First, which is a private police company at this point in, in, in the world. Police has been privatized and you have different private companies being hired to do police work. And so, you know, um, I thought, you know, if I, I hate detective fiction. Um, I have an issue with it, but then I thought, you know, if I ever wanted, wanted to do detective fiction, I could do like a whole graphic novel where, where with these two characters as the leads, um, uncovering some, I don't know, probably will have to do with some kind of corruption or something. Um, or, uh, you know, we have these, uh, there's a lot of sort of fictional advertisements also in in the world of the solar grid. so. You know, there's we 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 look we, we take a quick look at this band um, advertisement, and I'm like, well, if I ever wanted to do like a story of a band and their development and something, but <laughs> but but in a way that's interesting and not like not your typical band story. Well, I could just take this band and, and explore that in in detail, you know. Um, and you have all these different corporations who have different interests, like this one um, that builds these floating cities. Uh, for example, and maybe they have a conflict with um, this dude who wants to build the sky quench program, which would, uh, you know, basically cause the water to um, evaporate, and so on and so forth. So, if I want to do some kind of corporate uh, conflict espionage type story, I could do something with, with these various companies um, that exist. And yeah, like it's true, you know, it's it's a rich. Uh, 
it's a rich world. You know, I could do a whole series with this uh, journalist, you know, um, a Martian journalist on Earth, you know, and, and the things she uncovers in this in this uh, in this time and, and place. So it, it is it is very textural, and actually, like you said, even even this sequence here with the the talk show, this television um, talk show sequence. There's like this ticker at the bottom that's like shows like all kind of manner of of breaking news, and all of that is actually stories and tells you more about the world. And I could probably just take one of those and explore it more in depth if I wanted to. Um, uh, let me let me see. The uh, talk show is hilarious too. <laughs> it's a great scene. Yeah, it's interesting because it's one of those things that's like a, supposed to be a big no-no in comics. Like you don't have endless pages of just talking heads. You know, that's like you definitely have to have people walking around, fiddling with things. Um, and so it's a big no-no. But uh, but but um, I think the conversation is compelling enough that a lot of comments I get are like, "This is the best scene I've ever read in a comic book," and it's just like a bunch of talking heads. You know? um, and I just want to comment that that's something that I find interesting about your work in terms of the disregard issue um, and uh, in terms of you have attachments to so many different parts of culture you know whether it's like high art or street art or you know concept pop which is your own kind of definition of what you do and graphic novels and printmaking um, and in a lot of comics it's really necessary that they have a you know coherent kind of like consistent style and then there's like the one off you know or like the 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 needle drop to like the one scene where something is weird or the style is different whereas you just switch it up all the time like you change your style according to the narrative not according to like any kind of like it's not like changing the style isn't your exception. It's kind of like what you do all the time. So even just looking at these first three chapters, there's like, wow, there's like 12 different styles going on here. And I think for anyone else, that would just not work. But you have some underlying coherence, like some kind of courageous aesthetic thread that, that makes it work and keeps it going. But I do have a question. So yeah, that, uh, enough, you know, uh, enough complimentary um, slathering it on. Okay. Uh, one thing that I was wanted to ask you is that, uh, aside from all that, your characters are so exuberant. Like they're all like they're they don't seem like parodies, right? They don't. They're not like blown up. Like they seem really close to like real dramatic characters. Um, you know, in this graphic novel form. And I'm just wondering how many of these characters are coming from your life or your experiences? Um, because they all, um, you know, again, with a lot of comic book characters, it's like, you know, the superhero that has all these great, you know, powers, but no personality. That, that's like, to me, is the problem with all commercial comics. You know, it's like, Mm, script, not so good. Uh, superpower effects, awesome. But so where are your, where's the depth of your characters coming from? Um, it comes, uh, I think, uh, exactly like you said, like as a reaction to um, how, how, how cartoonish characters are in comics, even re quote unquote realistic comics. Uh, you know, characters, uh, the, the, any character's kind of like shtick or ethos or, or interest seems still even one dimensional. And, and, and to me, and not, not to crap over other people's work, but even the works that are considered like kind of like multi dimensional, with like fully kind of formed characters, they do still seem very kind of cartoonish, you know? And so, so one of the things I wanted to do with this is just make them like real people and that there's no such thing as someone who's just like the good guy and the bad guy and, and, and you know, you don't have that kind of 
split or dichotomy between characters the way the way you do because it, that's not how it is in the real world right you, you sort of see you know you could see uh, i i find that i find that sometimes you know someone you really love and admire will just something will come out of their mouths that'd be like what did he just say that you know, it happens you know and just like oh okay so every person and probably this applies to me as well you know maybe there are some things about me that are just seem in conflict with other parts of me i don't know um so i think it comes a little bit from from that from just like uh um, paying attention to actual people in the real world as opposed to people in fiction and wanting the people in your fiction to be a bit more like uh, people in, in the real world um, uh, be, because I do you know I, I'm not I'm not interested in I'm not really interested in genre and doing a work okay this is gonna exactly fit this style of genre or something and I think when you read the book it looks that way it's like another another uh, keyword these days aside from world building is genre bending right so it is genre bending not necessarily intentionally but also because we live in a genre bending world you know it's, it's uh, you know, there are maybe every once in a while there's a dead body floating in the bayou there. Um, so, you know, murders happen and, and uh, you know, crime noir shit happens, but also, you know, there's a love story happening in the park at the same time. There's no reason why you can't have all those things exist in the same story and a fictional story unless, you know, you, there's a deficiency in your own ability to, to uh, you know, depict something of the real world. Marshall and I recently participated in a, like a staff building uh, seminar or exercise. And we talked a lot about listening, active listening. And I'm realizing that the more deeply I listen to you and to other artists who are participating in my favorite book, the more I'm like, I, I, I need, if I'm listening, I'm not thinking about what I'm about to say. So I, so what I'm gonna say is just, uh, I appreciate what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and it will say, it's not, I don't have any response at the ready because I'm just going to let that gel. And I hope anybody else listening can really like take time to take it in um, because that's, that's you. That's like how you work and how you make this. And it's not a matter of how it should be or, um, you know, you, you are just your own work. Um, this is how you talk about it. And I value that. Um, and yeah, thanks, go ahead. thanks, Monica. I, I was going to say also it might have something to do a little bit with uh, growing up. Um, like I only had like access to comics, really. Like, you know, um, I mean, I had access to comics since a young age, but I had access to like the occasional comic book, right? Like, I was never, I never had the luxury of being able to like, okay, I'm going to collect like Spider-Man now, you know, forever, mm -hmm. and have like all Spider-Man from number one up until whatever uh you know which is which is something you know a lot of americans grew up with that uh privilege um uh but but i i i, I would find like the occasional comic every once in a blue moon at the newsstand and one time it would be a spider-man one time it would be a a batman one time it would be some random manga um uh, you know, it was just very random things. I have no idea how they ended up there. I have no idea what the distribution world, how it operated, but random bits. And in a way, by like reading bits and pieces of these various stories, I kind of got the gist of it. I didn't need to read the entire run of Spider-Man to, uh, to understand like the clone saga or whatever. I got it. Okay, he has a clone and then mm, there was this. And, and you could sort of get it from just like a little glimpse. And I think uh, I think that's reflected a little bit in the solar grid in that I, I kind of maybe, um, you know, I just bounce around between these bits and pieces of stories. And and, and it really, uh, it depends on the reader's own uh, participation to piece it together, like a puzzle a little bit, right? Which is why I think maybe why it might appeal to a certain um, audience who, who, who's possibly more interested in, um, not to insult other comic books, but more like grown up, more grown up. You just did textbooks and literature and things. You know? um, let me give a little structure to this. Not that this is unstructured, but um, let me just show 
for you folks watching. Um, so this is, this is how you get in touch with Gunzier. Not that we're saying goodbye right now, but I just wanna, this is how you find him on Instagram and on his own website. And then I also wanted to give a quick shout to Radix Media, who are also friends of ours. Um, they're a worker owned co-op printer and publisher, and we love them forever and ever and ever. And, <laughs> and they're publishing the series, right? Uh, in installments? Is that right? uh, uh, they are publishing the series in monthly installments. Um, okay. So one to three came out and four and five are coming out. And then they take a break and then resume the remaining five. Cool. And I will put a link in the show notes below when we're finished, but um, their website's radixmedia.org. And I am i know you guys ran something where you could actually subscribe to the whole series. Is that still an option to your knowledge? It, it, it is from their website, yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I need to get up to speed with that and get my own subscription. Um, no, sorry. sorry. We're, we're friends. I could hook you up. Okay. <laughs> I, I accept. I accept. Um, well, we're at 31 and a half minutes. Um, I love doing this flash programming because it's not totally uh, limitless uh, time, and we want to respect everyone's time who's here and watching. Um, I would like to offer some closing remarks to Marshall and then, and then Gunzier, if you have a final word about where people can find your work or just any closing thoughts that you have. Um, I'm waiting for the big book and I'm waiting for the freaking Hollywood movie version. Yeah. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> that, that's uh, the Hollywood uh, movie version that's going to, uh, you know, disappoint all of the early readers. <laughs> <laughs> right. They'll be like, this is a betrayal. How, how dare they? How dare they replace the little black girl? No, the, the betrayal right won't come. Right? The betrayal, like Hollywood. Dude, the betrayal won't come until the live action TV series. Because <laughs> <laughs> the action uh, yeah. figures are going to be really great. The, the what? Sorry? Action figures. The, oh, boy. <laughs> So let's put the train back on the tracks. Uh, <laughs> Gunzier, would you like um, to get us there? No, uh, just, uh, you know, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Um, you know, um, thanks for supporting um, indie books and small publishing, um, small press. Um, it's, it's where it's at. It's where all the good stuff is at. Always, in my, in my view, um, if you really want to see, you know, uh, the best culture, culture being produced, then you need to look at the fringes of culture and the underground, um, which requires a lot more work from us these days than it might have required in the past. So thank you all for supporting and that's it. Thank Great. you. And I'll just say that uh, if you're watching right now and you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel. I think we're up to maybe 41 subscribers wow. and counting. Um, very exciting. And then uh, tomorrow, Belden Sazen is going to be our special guest, and she's going to present her favorite book, which is called Weatrocities. So come back for that uh, tomorrow, June 24th at 7 p.m. Thank you so much, Gunzir. It was wonderful to see your beautiful face. I hope you stay well, you and your family. Thanks, Monica. Same to you. Great seeing you too, Marshall. Yeah, thank you, Gunzir. All right. Take care, guys. Good night.